So um, today's lecture builds on some elements that uh, we had started exploring uh, in, in the past uh, few lectures in a sort of a cursory reference uh, with cursory references. But um, uh, it's going to be really the first uh, lecture in which we're taking on the challenge squarely of, of discussing data science tools um, and their interception with, with modeling, um, with dynamic modeling of communicable diseases. Uh, now, in our last lecture, I had talked about uh, three different areas in which um, data science seeks to contribute, three sort of broad, um, broad types of problems it takes on. The problems of description, problems of prediction, and problems associated with causal prediction. All three of those articulate with dynamic models and transmission models for infectious disease as an example. Now, many of those types of problems are approached in data science in a fashion that leverages models, whether it's in the description area or the prediction or causal prediction area. Many of the approaches um, uh, that are explored within the data science paradigm are ones that draw on explicit models of one sort or another. Um, within description, we have tools like uh, generative adversarial networks. Uh, indeed, the particle filtering and particle MCMC fit into that um, into that area, pursued in, in, in ways that use models. And in prediction, we generally have a model, whether it's a logistic regression model or a model that uh, uh, is based on, on a connectionist paradigm, we have some sort of model that we're working with. Um, in many cases, it may be a Bayesian model. And similarly for, for um, causal prediction. But the description area in particular is also amenable to many types of exploration that are, are free of model assumptions. They don't posit a particular model. They don't postulate that this model is a good description of the data generating process uh, or the underlying processes in a world, in the world, and uh, therefore we'll hang our hat on it, we'll, we'll rely on it. Rather, they're in some sense, theory free. They, they don't impose a model. They let the data speak for itself. They let the data um, show its patterns. And within the description area, I had noted uh, several of these types of techniques. Um, and uh, I'll sort of prop up my, my slide here for a second, although it's not part of our our current slide set, um, it, it may uh, jog your memory. So, here we go. Um, you may recall this slide on description. Um, and I had noted that quite a few of these techniques um, uh, really seek to, to kind of provide an insight into or window into the underlying patterns in the data without imposing an a priori model structure. Uh, and some of those techniques uh, are ones that offer particular prominence and relevance in the context of dynamic modeling. Um, so we'll be focusing on this technique up here uh, for much of today's discussion, which is um, which was inspired by insights in dynamical systems can be used to great insight um, to try to understand patterns of causality that are operating in those systems, but can also be used to find hidden data and critically used to predict system evolution. Um, 
So uh, within this context, we'll be talking about this construct of phase space, the way in which we can take time series from the world. Uh, and without imposing any specific model particulars, uh, identify patterns within those time series, reveal hidden order, and reveal factors involving their evolution over time. Uh, plots which um, take this which undertake this strategy or, or, or analyses that undertake this strategy are increasingly common within the infectious disease area. Um, I took the liberty of gathering some of these from uh, Twitter, for example, uh, where they are fairly numerous among some of the leading practitioners of modeling, in this case in the UK. Plots of this sort sometimes go by the name of, of hurricane plots. Um, I heard uh, John Hong Wu and, and um, uh, Kumar, um, head of fields, uh, making reference to these just last week. Uh, and uh, there's, they, they use that name for a reason. Uh, what these are plotting out over time uh, involves uh, system measurements, uh, so measurements from the world, typically, um, where um, a measurement is placed on the x-axis for one measure and, say, daily reported cases. So the x position of a dot indicates the number of daily reported cases at that time. And the y position here is the number of, of daily reported deaths within 28 days of a, or that person died within 28 days of a positive diagnosis. And day after day, time is implicit, day after day, we plot out the data for that day um, from these two measurements, daily reported cases and daily reported deaths. And we plot it out on a, on a curve. In many cases, for, for ease of presentation in today's mechanisms, we make use of 2D plots. Um, I'm rather fond of, of exploring such data with, with three-dimensional plots, such as this, um, where we color code the data items uh, by the day, and we trace out their evolution over time. This from synthetic data um, that share some of the features of uh, real world world data showing cases, test positivity, and hospital census, and showing evolution over time during the pandemic, uh, including in recent time with Omicron, where we have a real increase in test positivity in cases over time and in hospital census over time. Now, uh, when we plot out in these contexts, whether to view it in a, in a rotating diagram like that through the Oculus, a virtual reality system as we've done or, or uh, in a 2D way, we often seek to, to recognize these salient patterns, uh, not only because they're intellectually interesting, but because they tell us something about how the system is evolving and critically, how it will continue to evolve. Um, so by noting these trajectories, where they're headed, the speed with which they're progressing, you notice these points, for example, being far apart are indicating a kind of fast moving phase of the outbreak. By contrast, uh, these points here so overlapped, we're at a time that there was moving more, more slowly. Um, and we're getting an evolution from light to dark over time. Uh, so we can get a sense of where it's headed. And, and this is one of the reasons I think people use the term hurricane diagram is because like with a hurricane, by tracking its path, we get a sense of where it might be going. That it might in this phase, for example, be heading in this area of lower daily deaths, but retaining fairly high case counts, fairly high case counts, or markedly reducing uh, daily case counts 
while not materially, while not greatly lowering deaths. And you see a bit of retrograde motion. So this is a model free characterization. There's no a priori model of, of how COVID-19 evolves that deaths follow cases or something like that. We, we kind of let the data speak for itself. Um, here we have hospitalizations, a, a sort of similar depiction with daily admissions and beds full. So this would be sort of the admissions versus the census, uh, the, the number of people who are in the hospital at any one time. Um, so uh, within this context, uh, we again have evolution for, I believe the, the colors here are, are, are different waves. Um, so again, we get a sense of kind of where we're at, where we're going um, with this uh, with this pandemic, um, and some have tried to you know lend additional uh, vigor to these graphs by by showing recent trajectories of different data points in a more uh, evocative fashion and giving a sense of say how cases are are how many cases are occurring in the past week versus uh, change in um, in the case rate here. Um, okay. Um, so we often see coming out of these diagrams, not just kind of random gobbledygook, but but actual structure behind here. This is actually using data from the uh, from the data set that I've provided you on the uh, on the site. Um, and what you could see here is is colors from successive waves, for example, uh, associated with the spread of infection. Um, okay, so with that reminder, I'd like to talk a little bit about the differentiation of some of these graphs. Uh, some of you may have noted a bit of sleight of hand. So on the one, the one hand, I was talking about graphs which have measure ands, two different measure ands, cases versus deaths, for example, or admissions versus census, um, new cases versus change in cases. Uh, by contrast, here I had this kind of odd construct. You'll notice it seems to be cases all around uh, for all three, uh, all three of these axes. Uh, but you notice there's a bit of curious notation here. I say T minus two times tau and T minus tau. So this axis is lagged by two legs. This one is lagged by one leg and this one is kind of the current cases. You may be wondering what's that all about? Um, and how does this relate to these patterns we see here? We see these cycles, these trajectories here just as we do here, but somehow we're looking at just one variable lag. And that will be the focus of a fair bit of our lecture, because if you understand this, you can understand how you can weave gold from straw, as it were, how you could take a single, op single measurement, a single type of measurement, and turn it into an insightful understanding of the trajectories that can give you a sense of evolution over time, which is what one of the most common tricks of data science in this area. And it draws on discoveries in system science. Again, model free, theory free, not imposing any model on it and letting the data speak for itself. Okay, so let's go see how that works. Uh, so, uh, here, I will just note to head off some confusion. Within today's lecture, I'm going to be focusing on goals that are uh, assuredly up at this level of understanding. We're true to the paradigm of, of data science and the spirit of data science. We are taking on data on its own, on, on it, on its own terms on the face of it, uh, and seeking to gain insight into the patterns that come from this data. 
Um, and we're doing so in a way that eschews any commitment to models down here. We're not hanging our, 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 our hat on or hitching our cart to the horse of a particular model. We're instead uh, observing the data on its own terms. Um, however, in order to help you understand the relationship between this data and the underlying system, in order to explain why often we build these plots with one variable shown on both axes, but at the current time and a previous time, I want to make use of models to show that to you. Those models are not, uh, are not constructs we need when we encounter the data, but they can help us understand why we're seeing certain patterns. And they can help us understand what the data is whispering to us, what it's intimating to us about the character of the underlying system. What is it telling us about the underlying system, the system that's giving rise to this data? So I'm going to use models to kind of illustrate that, to show how the characteristics of the underlying system bubble up into data. But please don't confuse that with any sort of, uh, um, with any, with undercutting the idea that these patterns are model independent. No, it's just that, um, they often we see these patterns independently of a model but often we use the the patterns in a way that makes us ask what is going on in this underlying system that could explain these patterns the patterns so um uh, speak on their own terms getting access to the patterns seeing them anticipating where the system might be going doesn't require a model okay so i'm going to ask I'm going to open up some models and you're welcome to follow along in any logic. I would pull it up, but please don't confuse that with, you know, that somehow these are model based techniques. Uh, no, the data patterns will, that will pop out are independent of models. Okay. Um, so to understand this, I want to go back to this notion that we spoke about um, uh, in passing during our discussion of, of, of infectious disease systems. Um, uh, of infectious disease modeling, transmission modeling. And we spoke there about model state space. Um, and model state space uh, provides an alternative to uh, an alternative way of interpreting uh, the evolution of a dynamical system. We have two primary lenses within this area. We have a lens of behavior over time and we have a lens of behavior and state space. Um, and within a uh, state space, uh, we will depict the current state of, of the system by placing along the axes uh, different variables associated with system state, say the number of susceptibles, the number of uh, infected, or the number of temporarily immune people where we using a model such as that now we can build these state space plots using measured data they they aren't truly the full state space but they're an approximation to it and they can give us insight into the structure of the true state space using this technique of delay embedding that we'll be getting to but um the whole notion of of having a plot of behavior over time of some of, of some data is, is a familiar one to everyone here. But here we're we're creating a plot where time is not an axis, where instead the axes have to do with state variables from a model or or measured quantities from the world. Um, and you know a given a given a progress of a model or, or evolution of the system in the world is associated with their trajectory, right? Um, so we, we saw this with those trajectories, those loops from England, for example. Um, as I noted then, time is implicit. We, we don't explicitly have a time axis, rather each point comes from a different time and 
you can kind of look at how far apart they are and infer, okay, this is moving quickly because you know they're sampled one day apart or what have you. But, um, uh, but time is not represented on an axis. Um, so here we might have a system, for example, where we have data from the world and we have synthetic cases on one axis, uh, synthetic uh, hospitalizations on another, and synthetic test positivity on yet another. So a given data point here would be from a day in which there was a certain number of cases, that's its location on that axis, a certain test positivity, that's its location on this axis, uh, and a certain number of people in hospital, that's its location on that axis. Um, again, this is synthetic data, but it has the, the, the flavor of, of real world data. Um, this is from data that's sh shared with you, but here I'm looking at cases um, uh, on all of the axes. And again, this is current cases, former cases. So if tau was one, this would be one day, cases one day ago. So this is cases today, this axis vertically. This might be, um, um, this might be the number of, of cases uh, yesterday, and this the number of cases two days ago. Okay, um, so in order to uh, examine this, I'd like to uh, go make use of some of the models that I placed on the site. So I have placed um, on the site uh, two models, which I think will be uh, instructive for SIR, and then a, uh, a third model, um, which is uh, this one, um, uh, Lorenz attractor with volatility. Um, so the ones I'd like you to get are, excuse me, SEIR ABM state space illustration version three, if you'd like to follow this along, Lorenz attractor with volatility, and SEIRS compartmental space state space illustration. Um, some of these others, um, uh, like this predator prey uh, one or the delay embedded prevalent case count, uh, there's some thoughtful stuff there, but I don't know that we'll have time to explore it. Um, so uh, I'm going to go uh, download this. Um, just to show you, if you want to download it, you should be able to just click through and, and get a link like that uh, and click on that to download it, okay? And then for those that are zipped, you're going to want to um, zip them up uh, so that, oh, sorry, unzip them so that you can get access to them. This one and this one, uh, the second one and this last one, those ones shouldn't require any unzipping. Okay. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the SEIRS compartmental state space illustration version six in any logic, okay? Um, and uh, that one is um, illustrated right here. Um, so if you were to go download it and open it in any logic, you would see something Familiar, we've actually opened a previous version of this model together, and I actually sent you a video showing it's depicting its construction. So here we have a count of people who are susceptible, exposed, infectious, and recovered. Um, and we have a process by which there's a natural history of infection. People that get infected become exposed, they're in a latent state, after some period of time, they become infectious, they recover. And then after some amount of time, this mean time into waning immunity, they lose immunity. Great. You actually pursued a question on this in the context of your um, first assignment, the first exercise. Um, but I've elaborated, augmented, embellished this model with 
uh, some additional components, uh, which are located up above. There's actually two of them. Um, uh, the first of them is going to depict, in a state-based plot, susceptible versus infectious. Um, now, again, this isn't a full state space. I'm not characterizing a four-dimensional plot because uh, depicting that even here would be uh, challenging and trying to share it over the Zoom connection would be, would be very challenging indeed. Um, instead, it's it's a collapsed state space. It, it's collapsed down to two dimensions here, susceptible and infectious. And what this means is the number of susceptible people um, will be the measurement of this stock. It'll be shown on the x-axis and the y-axis will be infectious. Now, again, I'm showing you, I'm going to be showing you here something that will depict results using a model. But I'm going to be looking at data of the sort that in principle could be collected from the world in, in, in some cases. And in, in some cases, in principle, one could, you know, conduct a sort of prevalence study to estimate the number of susceptible people versus currently infectious people, for example. Um, and uh, and plot them out. So here I'm I'm running this model. Um, we have a plot down here which shows its time behavior. We've discussed this time behavior previously. Um, so I'm plotting out the number of infectious people here. Um, there should be a better label. Um, but initially it starts very low. It grows exponentially. It rises to a peak when it's non-sustainable where the effective reproductive number equals one, each infective infects exactly one person before recovering, and where the inflow equals the outflow to the infectious stock, and then it collapses down and sort of rebounds a little bit until it approaches an endemic equilibrium. Okay, that shouldn't be surprising. This is time on the x-axis, number of infection, people, the, the infectious case count on the y-axis. And you notice it's going towards an asymptote. Up here, however, you see the state space plot for that. Here we have susceptible on the x-axis and infectious on the y-axis. This also shouldn't be too big uh, a leap for you because you will have seen it in my lectures on infectious disease, uh, dynamics of infectious disease. We start with many susceptibles and few infectives. Uh, as time goes on, the, the susceptibles come down and the infections rise. Um, until that point, it becomes unsustainable. Uh, effective reproductive number equals one. And then we, we go down and we approach an endemic equilibrium following a, a diminution of the, of the number of, uh, uh, the number of, of uh, infectious individuals uh, down to some endemic equilibrium. But up at the top here, I'm, actually present, so that's a state space plot of sorts. It's depicting the same system, the same evolution, but through the lens of state space. Um, uh, the analogy being much of what you would have seen uh, uh, like uh, here and in, in, in these, oh, oh sorry, um, I stand corrected, uh, like what you saw in these plots, right? We'll plot out two things that we could in principle measure. Um, okay, um, so uh, so that's nice, but, but in this case, um, we have one more plot further up, which is, uh, which depicts a single measure amp at two different times, prevalence, horizontally currently and prevalence one day ago vertically. Okay. Um, and you see a kind of similar bent. It, it kind of looks like, and if, if you were to zoom in here, you might be able to make out the fact that it, it sort of curves around um, here. It, it sort of bends, bends around. You could see a little bit about that, about that bend, if only the, uh, the dots were a bit smaller. Um, this should remind you a little bit of this, but in a kind of squeezed, compacted way, in a manner that's been unhealthily squashed, right? Um, but it has this general flavor of it uh, 
increasing and then turning around and doubling back on itself and then spiraling in towards the end. And in fact, if you were to zoom in and the dots were smaller, you would see a little spiral there, much as there's a little spiral here that eludes visual detection, ready visual detection. Um, so this is a this is a a, a model that's uh, has very nice behavior. It's very smooth. Um, it exhibits kind of an analytic evolution that's that's very well behaved. Uh, uh, rather unlike many real world systems, um, where we have noisy data, we have data that jumps around, we have measurement error. We have all the sort of things that I alluded to in talking about the challenges of the data generating process. Um, and you know, these measurements we record are not from heaven. They are they are imperfect measurements of a uh, stochastically evolving underlying dynamical system. So to get a flavor of, of what that's like a little bit more, I'm going to open up the second model. Um, and the second model will depict the situation uh, quite analogous to this one. Um, so uh, the second model is this SEIRS ABM state space illustration version three. Okay. Um, so here we're going to have a depiction um, of the evolution of a of a system and, and excuse me, I, I, I stand corrected, of um, the natural history of infection uh, between comparable states, a susceptible state, a latent state, an effective state, and a recovered state. Fair enough. Uh, and like with the compartmental model, there was a loss of immunity that occurs after a certain mean period of time. Okay. Um, so uh, that's great. Um, uh, so this should be broadly familiar. Uh, there's a few small differences. For example, this progression from exposed to infective occurs after exactly an amount of time instead of a, an, 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 a mean amount of time. Um, and people are placed in networks and contact each other. Um, also, these transitions, including this one here um, for contact, um, including when people lose immunity, are stochastic. Um, who people are in contact with, who infects whom, is stochastic. It, it, it varies randomly, um, uh, as is typical, as we noted, in, in age-based models. Um, OK, so what I'd like to do here um, is to take a look at the evolution of this uh, a very similar system, but with networks and the stochastics over time. So we're going to run this model to give us a little bit more of a taste of, of you know, when we're dealing with data from the world that's stochastic, that's imperfect, it's, it's incomplete, it's, it's noisy, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to right click on large population state, no income based crowding here, okay? Um, and what we're going to see is, is a population knit together into networks. Now, uh, these networks can be based on, um, their density can be based on people's income. In this case, I've, I've chosen not to, uh, not to include this. But you'll notice if we scroll up, if you click on this and scroll up, we have a measure of incident case count and the fractional prevalence in the population. So infection is spreading here. And you can see, in fact, infected individuals shown in red um, uh, as it's spreading across this network to ever further as it percolates across this, this uh, uh, this network of infected individuals. And up here above it, I've, I've illustrated the projected state space, okay? Um, projected because we're, again, only depicting a, a projection down of a, of a higher dimensional state space. 
before we projected out SEIR to just two of those susceptible and infected. Here we're, we're undertaking a, a projection that's altogether much uh, bolder, more audacious. We are taking an extraordinarily high dimensional state space involving a state of every darn person in this population who could be in one of four states. And we are summarizing it with two measures. Uh, on the one hand, the number of susceptibles, on the other hand, the number of infected people on this y-axis. So we don't care if it's Sam and Mary who are infected and John and Sarah who are uninfected or John and Sarah are infected and Sam and Mary are uninfected. It's just uh, a prevalence of two. And so we get out, you know, a stochastic evolution um, uh, of this system. Um, it's evolving stochastically. And it's moving towards an endemic equilibrium, which you could see actually forming right here. Um, if we go up, uh, we, we could see what this looks like over time as it's evolving, the stochastics are clear. Um, and we could actually see up here a, a depiction of the, um, and I'm gonna show it over here, that the, the projected space space, uh, state space, uh, in a fashion where we have, and I believe this is infections on the one axis versus infections in the previous day on the y axis. And you can see it kind of, it's, it's not totally all over the map. It's not going over in this quadrant or that quadrant. It's staying somewhere close to this, to this uh, y equals x line, which makes sense since infections yesterday clue us somewhat into infections today but um but you notice they're evolving in um in ways that are are quite stochastic so when we're dealing with uh, a stochastic system these nice measures are a little bit uh more variable um and uh we can see signs of evolution over time and endemic circling but it's kind of a little bit muddled um, because of the stochastic nature of what's being depicted. Um, you could kind of see they they kind of just smack down on top of each other uh, rather than being in a nice curve like we saw before. Um, but for these sorts of models, whether they're stochastic, like from an ABM, or like as we could generate synthetic data from an ABM, or whether they are uh, deterministic, they um, they have a lot of these features of of evolving over over time in a way that's structured. Um, we can characterize the the underlying dimensionality of this evolution in a way that can be insightful. So. If you discover that the system you're working with evolves only in a plane, that is, um, it may look three dimensional, but maybe uh, if you look at it from the side, you see it, it's all in a plane. That actually tells you something about this system. Um, it tells you it can be represented in a lower dimensionality. Um, it tells you uh, intrinsically it's not three-dimensional, but something closer to two-dimensional. And what that whispers to us about the underlying system state is, well, we might think nominally this requires three state variables to summarize it. We need three separate numbers. All it really takes is two. It's all in a plane. We just have to identify where we are in the plane. It's you know, a bit like this piece of paper. This is this piece of paper is intrinsically a two-dimensional object, even if I kind of bend it a little bit. It's a two-dimensional object. To tell you where something is on this piece of paper, uh, all I need is two coordinates uh, on this piece of paper. It tells how much of it is along this axis and that axis. Um, it may be embedded in three space and in, in three dimensions, but it's not intrinsically uh, a three-dimensional object. It's a two-dimensional structure embedded in three dimensions. And we see this a lot with real-world data. 
um, when we examine it. And you know, one thing that can be quite handy, and I'll be providing you code to do this, is to actually take a look at the data. And you can see this one, for example, is exactly on that sort of curve, right? If you look at it from the side, for example, um, there's kind of a curve going up here that's, that's pretty close to intrinsically two-dimensional. Um, it all stays within a certain orderliness. And again, this is not merely a, a nice thing. It suggests that there's some conservation going on. There's less information you need to specify that system um, than is currently specified within these, uh, within these different axes. So that's one way as modelers, if we want to model the underlying system and we see empirical data that is, that is intrinsically lower dimensional, um, it, it suggests to us, hmm, maybe there is a simpler way I could represent this. Maybe I don't need as many state variables. Um, okay, now to get to this um, understanding of these depictions, which characterize uh, the evolution of a system, not in terms of different state variables, but the same state variable at different points of time, I need to walk you through some points of, of explanation. Okay. Um, and I want to go back to the points I made um, during uh, a lecture probably two or three times ago about coupled nonlinear systems. I had kind of a digression in that. This probably was three or four times ago now, where I I went and I talked about diagonalization and and waxed uh, enthusiastic about how linear systems allow us to take them apart into pieces and and characterize each piece in isolation, but nonlinear systems are kind of intrinsically tangled. We can't neatly decompose them. Um, uh, and when we're dealing with infectious disease systems, we're dealing with such a case. The evolution of one state variable kind of intrinsically depends on uh, others. We can't nicely piece it apart. Amongst other things, we can't piece it apart separately into a model associated with susceptibles evolving and another with infectious involving. We need two to tango. We need both together to be able to be simulated. And yeah, evolution of one depends on the other. Um, uh, and what this means at an informational level is that the information in one variable is often ends up getting encode about one variable, it encodes information about other variables. Um, now, I have to apologize. Um, this slide got mangled as I, as I imported it. And these dots should be atop uh, their respective um, uh, their respective symbols. Um, uh, so they are derivatives, right? This is time derivative of X and time derivative of Y. Many of you may recognize this system. It's the Latka Volterra system um, uh, showing the evolution of, of predators and prey. So uh, X here might be hares, snowshoe hares, and Y might be lynxes, or X might be you know, uh, gophers and Y coyotes, um, or we might have X being mice and Y being hawks or something like that. Um, and basically what this is saying is, you know, the, the, the prey can reproduce at a certain rate. Rabbits are famously fast at reproducing, um, but they get killed off by, by um, by encountering their predators, why? So there's kind of this cross term indicating the number of contacts between the susceptible, the predator, the prey, and the predators. And then the predators, um, by contrast, they uh, their numbers are buoyed by or, or enhanced by those interactions. Um, uh, they can actually grow faster. The more interactions there are, because their their uh, their babies don't are less likely to die. They can have bigger litters of of babies. You know, there could be 
four link baby links that survive instead of two, etc. Um, but they die at a certain rate delta. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, of natural causes. So um, here, the important thing is that this is a couple, a few important points. This is a coupled system. We talk about lynxes and hairs, and I describe each of these, but these are intrinsically linked, right? The evolution of hairs is tied up with the number of lynxes. The number of links is tied up with the number of hairs. We can't imagine evolving one without the other. They are entangled together. But here's the deal. Examined from a data perspective, if we had data, let's say, um, only in terms of hairs, and we always, maybe it's devilishly hard to collect data on links. Um, maybe that's, they're notoriously shy and, and uh, avoid human intruders, um, avoid drones. And, and so all we have data on is hairs, that's X. Um, well, in this case, if we know the number of hairs at a given time, um, uh, X, and we know the rate of change of it, after all, we could ask how fast is that increasing or decreasing compared to you know month by month. It's going up by five per month or it's going down by 10 per month. That's X dot. Um, if we had that, if you think about it and we were clever, we could actually compute, it, were, the, were this model true, we could actually compute the number of linkses. Um, so uh, these techniques will not depend on, on an underlying model, but, but, but humor me this. If we had a system like this, if you have a, a coupled system like this, in general, you, you're gonna be able to know about one variable through the other. So to illustrate this with this model, here, Y is so tied up with X, we can, in this case, we could solve for Y, in terms of terms involving x only, right? Um, so x dot equals alpha x minus beta x y. Okay, yeah, okay, well, what about it? Well, look, let's just make it x dot minus alpha x on the left, bring this term over, and then we'll divide by beta x over there, and we'll get y equals exactly this term. So, so what this is saying is that, you know, the information that is in the time series X, the information that is collected about pairs actually whispers to us something about lynxes. It's, it's telling us something about lynxes. There's information about lynxes in that. Were this a correct model of the underlying system, we could just read off the number of lynxes from knowing this information about pairs. Now, in general, we don't know the model underlying the system, and we don't need to know it. But what this is telling us is that uh, that for these systems, in general, information about one state variable tells us something about others, whether we know the model or not. Um, so, uh, you know, this may sound strange. How could it be the number of hairs encodes information about lengths? But if you if you think about it, I mean, as a common sense mechanism, if a trapper were out there and saw there's very, very few hairs around right now, um, they might be inclined to think, oh, the lynx population must be really up. You know, we must be in one of those years where it's a really big lynx population. Or if there's tons and tons of hairs running around, say, where are the lynxes? There must be very few lynxes right now. Um, Knowing about one tells you a lot about the other. If you know the prey are expanding really rapidly, um, uh, if the, the hairs are expanding really rapidly, it's probably tell you there's not many links around. If it's dropping like crazy, you, it may be an indication there are a lot of links around. So when we have a coupled system, when we have a nonlinear coupled system, like we do in infectious disease modeling, knowing, having data about one state variable, having data about one thing in the system, whispers to us about the other things and intimates to us. It, it, it hints to us about 
the other state variables as well, because they're intrinsically tied together. They're so entangled that listening carefully to one will tell you something about the others. Um, uh, okay, so that was, I was using a model to kind of motivate this, to say, suppose we had this underlying nonlinear system like this, I wanted you to build a certain sense of plausibility that it's not a crazy idea to say one state variable encodes information about the other. Um, the powerful thing here is this holds true for empirical data, regardless of whether you know the model or not, with no knowledge of the model. Um, uh, basically, when you're drawing data from a coupled nonlinear system, um, information about one piece of the system clues you in to the broader system. Um, uh, it, it clues you in to this, uh, uh, to, to the state of the system. And uh, in the 1980s, uh, Flemish mathematician uh, Flores Takens, um, I think he was Flemish, in any case, he was Dutch, um, uh, came up with a, a brilliant uh, and impactful theory. And basically, he showed that under a broad set of conditions, for a very broad set of nonlinear coupled systems, we can reconstruct the state of that system using just a single time series from that system. Let me say that again. What he said is, look, give, it, give me a single time series from this system. Time series of hairs over time, or time series of number of detectives over time. Time series of the number of new, new infections for each point in time, maybe. Uh, be another alternative. Test positivity over time. Um, any of these. Give me one time series. One of these. And I can reconstruct the state of a much broader system using that time series. Now, there's limits to this. Um, the factors need to be coupled to that. If you can't reconstruct things that are for example, uh, uh, strictly have, have absolutely zero um, uh, causal coupling at all with this thing directly or indirectly. Um, but it's, it's very powerful for what it suggests. Um, uh, and um, he not only showed that this is true, that you can in principle, he gave a recipe for it. And the recipe is very simple. The recipe is as follows. So given observations from the world, y, uh, which will denote y as y of t, um, where each time point is denoted y bracket t, and so y at that time, it's indexed by, by time. For each point in time, we will create a vector. You'd say, well, what do you mean create a vector? Okay, so suppose we have a time series of number of new diagnosed cases of infection um, for day one, day two, day three, day four, etc. Um, for each of those days, other than the first few where you can't go backwards, um, uh, let's say for for day four, we could create a a vector um, consisting of the values on day four, that would be at the top here, day three, day two, day one, and day zero. That would be a five vector, a vector with five elements in it. Okay, that's for day four. For day five, we would have that vector, the top element will be the value for day five, day four will be next, day three, day two, and day one. That'll be the five factor for that day. For time 10, day 10, it will be day 10, the value for day 10, that's just single value, it's part of the vector, right? It's the first element of the vector. Value for day nine, will be the number of infected people on day nine will be the second element of the vector. Number of effect, or excuse me, number of uh, diagnosed cases on day nine will be the second vector. 
Second element, number of, of diagnosed cases on day eight would be the next, and all the way down to what, whatever it is, day six, I think. Um, so for each point in time, we would have a vector, and that vector's elements will be elements from the original time series delayed by a certain amount. I use delay one there. Um, so the current time, you know, so the value, the vector for day 10 will be day 10 minus, and then the, the, the second element, so will be the value, the number of, of reported cases on day 10. The next element of vectors, number of reported cases on day nine, that's with tau equal one. Tau could be three, it could be five. And it turns out we get to choose tau uh, per our convenience. Um, uh, and if we do this, we, we go from a time series of scalars, right, of, of particular measurements, to a time, a time series, as it were, of, of, uh, of vectors. But actually, we don't, we don't, often we, we, we're not particularly caring about a big time series. Sometimes we do. Um, but the idea is that we, um, we then populate space with these vectors. So maybe the, we have a three space, maybe for every time point, we have a, a three vector, vector with three entries on it. Current one, one on yesterday and the one the day before, um, for example. Um, and we put it into, uh, we put it into space. Um, so to examine this, this, this may sound bizarre, um, but it actually works. And I'd like you to, to open up, you, you don't have to do this, but um, I think I will do it uh, here. I'm going to open up the uh, Lorenz attractor, okay? Um, uh, and this may be something you just want to watch. It's not a, it's not a uh, model uh, from infectious disease. It's a model of atmospheric circulation by uh, meteorologists, uh, uh, Edward, or meteorological scientist Edward Lorenz. Um, it's a nonlinear model, and uh, I'm going to run it. So, so here's a here are this set of equations it involves three differential, coupled differential equations um, involving x, y, and z. And you can see from the arrows that they're coupled. For example, the derivative of z depends on x. Hence this link and a y this link, um, and uh, the derivative of, uh, for example, y depends on x and on y, etc. Um, z also its evolution dependent on z, etc. Um, so it's a coupled nonlinear system, um, and if we run this, um, we will find with this Lorentz attractor um, that it etches out what is called a strange attractor um, in dynamic, dynamical systems parlance. Um, you could see it, you could see it here. Um, but what I'm showing you is three depictions. It's a three-dimensional structure. Ideally, I did each of you wearing an Oculus and you could see it in 3D. Um, it's a very nice object to see in th three dimensions. But here are three projections of it uh, with X and Y, with uh, uh, X and Z and Y and Z, kind of looking at it from three different angles. Um, fair enough. So we're plotting out sort of the pseudo state space, the collapsed state space, the projected state space. The actual state space is three dimensions. We've just collapsed it on to two of the dimensions at a time, right? Um, sort of hidden the others. But here is a depiction of x, for example, versus previous x. Or um, I think this is actually y. Um, I would have to look at this. Um, um, no, this is actually a prolonged lag. I think that's what it is. Um, in any case, um, uh, you'll notice that this kind of eerily mirrors um, uh, this one. Uh, so we have 
uh, we have basically a more or less correspondence between these two. Um, this is not an accident. Um, per Taken's theorem, any one time series contains information about the evolution of the whole system. And so if you depict that time series in this embedded way, this is an embedded, right? For every time point, we have a vector. The vector gives an X value and a Y value, an X value and a Y value. We just plot these things out in space. Um, you know, in R, I have this nice ability to kind of rotate these things around and I'll be giving you the code to do that. Um, so we've turned each time point into, uh, in this case, it's actually, uh, in this case, it's actually for three different ones, but I could show you them for, uh, uh, for an embedded one in just the same one. And, and so there we might be embedded in three space. So in short, um, we can reconstruct the underlying 3D times state space um, using two dimensions. Uh, I did it here in R um, in three dimensions. This is a 2D reconstruction. Oh, this is a 3D from X alone. So here I, I took only the X values and I plotted them out over time. And lo and behold, it reconstructs the structure of the system just kind of squeezed and twisted and kind of squished in some way. Um, and so it is with a lot of systems. Uh, this is another case uh, from our group working with physiologic data, for example. So delay embedding is this way in which we get our um, time series for nonlinear systems, nonlinear coupled systems, like we have in infectious disease models to speak to us, to speak about the broader system. Um, and so while we'll often make use of these sort of graphs like this one, which show two, two you know, different measurements, um, often we will uh, be looking at the same measurement. Um, uh, on all of the axes, and you'll find these quite popular too, where we have say three axes and we're looking at the same one, it's simply delay embedded. So each of these dots is from a vector consisting of the current value, the previous value, um, and, uh, and the twice previous value, you know, value before that, yeah, two times ago. Um, and as a result, we can get these trajectories that are from a single time series that are like these hurricane plots, um, but using a single measurement. Um, and that gives us a sense of where the system might be going, uh, where it's headed. Um, in this case, it's a system with, with some noise added, but it's, um, actually, I think this is from the synthetic data set I gave you. And so you can kind of see it uh, evolving here, but by examining its bearing and where it's headed and how quickly we can get a sense of where we're going over the next little bit. And those specializing in this sort of approach will make use of prediction mechanisms such as simplex based prediction, which essentially project forward these trajectories using time series prediction um, uh, met methods uh, to, to project forward, where is the system going over the next little bit with respect to the quantities being shown here in the, um, uh, in the plot. So here be with respect to cases, um, uh, here will be with respect to cases and deaths. Uh, but these nonlinear prediction tools can, can impose some sort of projection of a curve such as this. 
the curve itself is my point does it require a model once you start getting into using simplex based projection now you're starting to impose some sort of model um, on it but the curve itself the insights it offers about are we headed towards fewer cases and hospitalizations can be very substantive, um, very helpful. So if you look when when using this data, for example, at where um, previous uh, waves of infection have have left you, you might be able to get a sense of where you are now. Um, and uh, you know, here, for example, in the UK, um, those who are posting this thing were were commenting, okay. You know, here the green wave is is leading around. Uh, this is where we're at. We're probably headed back in terms of admissions and in terms of census, in terms of the system's momentum, how it's moving. Um, uh, we we kind of see for previous waves how it behaved, and here we can look at it from a single wave. So these sort of plots can be can be created based on multiple time series, as you have here, um, where each point is from a particular day for this time series to the same day for this one. Or, or it could be, you know, uh, it can be elicited from a single time series with delay embedding. Um, okay, so um, uh, time is moving on. So I want to, uh, I want to go, uh, take a look um, at just a few additional points on this because we're going to come back to this topic later in the course um, in the context of deducing causal structure of the system. I will say that tau, this delay that is used, whether these vectors are today, yesterday, the day before, today, last week on this day, two weeks ago on this day, um, whether tau is one or seven in that case, um, uh, here, um, this choice does have practical import. Uh, in theory, with Taken's theorem, given a large enough amount of data, you can you could reconstruct the underlying state space either way. But if you're looking, let's say at cases, right, today and cases, um, you know, tau time ago, in cases two time ago. Um, it turns out tau could make a big difference. If you're looking at very small increments of time, say a day, cases today are probably gonna be pretty similar to cases yesterday. Um, they're not gonna be wildly different and pretty similar to cases the day before. So if you're plotting it in 3D, they're gonna, a lot of that is gonna line up on this, diagonal hmm. but if you were to look two days apart well now there's a bigger change from two days ago and and from two days ago to four days ago bigger bigger change yeah yeah um or this is four days this is eight days and you start to see this um structure which is kind of squished in here um on the diagonal uncomfortably on the diagonal you know, getting fleshed out. And you start to see these trajectories around it, which reflect certain hiatuses out of this kind of uh, endemic state in the center. This is from other other data here. Um, so, you know, as we change tau, we can capture different elements uh, of structure. And generally, you look for a situation where you want to have tau be large enough. It's not so autocorrelated. It's right on the on the um, on the y-axis. Um, or sorry, on the diagonal axis. I'm going to have you build some of these sort of plots from the synthetic data I've given you as part of the exercise, and um, uh, I'll give suggestions for tau that are fruitful um, for that data. Those of you familiar with R will be able to use my uh, some some functions uh, with an R that I'll give you. Um, so why would you do this embedding? Um, you might 
you might plausibly have some appreciation for why you might use these uh, hurricane plots, um, for example, uh, uh, that we were we were talking about. These sort of um, oh, I've lost it. Okay, um, these these hurricane plots where we sort of capture the the bearing and the speed and the and the direction um, that the system is taken from independent measured data. You might have some appreciation for that. Is the system headed in a better direction? If we put together recent data points, does it look like it's improving in its direction? That's important. And it's it's uh, hard to get that sense from looking at you know three different time series plots all at once. In a state space plot where you see that bearing and three dimensions or two dimensions, it can reach out and, and strike you. I do this on a daily basis with our health system data and relay that to health system colleagues. But embedding, why would you, why would you do that? Well, one thing I said is you could take a single time series and, and create those plots. And that's true. And it's really valuable. Um, but it turns out that there's 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 several additional motivations for it. One thing is you can get a sense of the intrinsic dimensionality of the system. Is this a, intrinsically a two-dimensional system or versus a three or even four-dimensional system? You could start to get some hints of that from this data, from this embedded data. Now that's saying a lot, right? If it could be represented two dimensions, if all the system dynamics, all the sound and fury is just on two dimensions, that's telling you there's enough conservation there or symmetry or what have you that it can be represented more simply with two state variables. Um, it can tell you something about the prediction of the system. I noted these prediction algorithms. Simplex based prediction is a, is a popular one for projecting forward those trajectories, those big arcs you could say project this forward um, with minimal assumptions uh, compared to what would be needed when you bring a dynamic model to the table, right? Um, it's using, it's, it's kind of letting the data speak for itself and adding a bit of projection machinery on top. That's pretty powerful, at least as an alternative way of projecting system state forward that eschews any commitment to a, a dynamic model. Um, and finally, you can assess causal influences via convergent cross mapping. And this is really powerful. We're going to be coming back to this, I hope, in, in the final lectures of this course. But the idea is as follows, that using this sort of theory, uh, you can actually use it to determine the degree to which one system is driving another by assessing the skill of what's called cross mapping, figuring out uh, location and, and from one system, from one, the system has reconstructed from one state variable, say X versus it has reconstructed for Y, you can figure out are X and Y coupled or are they independent? And which, if they're coupled, is X driving Y? Is Y driving X? Is both, are both driving each other? Um, and it can allow you to tease out to what degree are they in, genuinely influencing each other or to what degree are they just correlated in a non-causal way because something else is driving both of them. You know, some variable A is driving X and it's driving Y. So they look correlated, but there's no causal interaction between them. It turns out by reconstructing a system from X, got to get a portrait of it there, reconstructing it from Y and relating those to one another, you can get that insight, which is driving which, including bidirectionally or neither. And that's really exciting too, because beyond giving us hints as to dimensionality, beyond giving us hints as to where the system is headed by, by eyeballing it and saying, look, where's it going? 
or by running simplex projection. We can also get clued in to causal structure of the system that we need to capture within our models. We can know, is this merely a correlation or is there a likely causal driving going on here between one thing and another? And that's very powerful. We can also use it to judge. We can use these methods finally to kind of judge the fidelity of our models or simulation models to a real world system because we're used to kind of matching up data from the world on a per data point basis, right? We, we calibrate our model to best match patterns in the world or we'll MCMC it or we'll ABC it with approximate Bayesian computation or particle filter, right? And all that's well and good and, and very, very important. My heart is there. But one thing we can also do, ladies and gentlemen, is we can create from real world time series, we could recreate what are they telling us in terms of an underlying state space. So we could compare that to what we get out of our model, saying, what does that underlying state space look like? And to what degree are they similar or different? It provides another way of kind of judging the fidelity of the model, whether a model, when we do have it, is capturing the essential features of this system. But ladies and gentlemen, the, you know, the, the really, I think, exciting points about this is that these are, are techniques that do not require commitment to models. They are techniques that allow the data to speak for itself. And through the principles of dynamical systems, those, that data speaks to us more loudly, more insistently, more insightfully than would be possible otherwise, because it allows us to recognize features of the underlying system reconstructed through delay embedding. And it allows us to use the tools of, of delay embedding, even visually, to have a sense of where the system is evolving over time in ways that might be challenging in a system where we only have one measurement. With just one measurement, one set of data on test positivity or one set of data on cases, we can get insight visually into system evolution and potentially in terms of prediction. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, today I've uh, aspired to, to point out to you um, these, this functionality, which is um, gifted to us by these principles of, of system science when applied to data. Um, and what we'll be doing in subsequent lectures is we'll be starting to work with techniques that make use of some models of one sort or another. Uh, those models will come progressively more, more advanced. Next time we'll be talking about the use of regression models uh, to estimate basic reproductive number, for example, or how we could do this. I'll allude to how we could do the same thing with recovery rate to estimate system parameters from real, real world data. We'll then go on to talk about a simpler form of model that posits dynamic evolution of a system, the hidden Markov model. Um, and we'll go on to approximate Bayesian computation, particle filtering, particle on CMC with, a, with an ever richer set of models. Um, but never forget, that much insight can be gleaned, um, much power can be gained by taking data, looking at it in its own terms in a clever way using the mechanism of state space, also called phase space plots, and using principles of delay embedding, realizing that even a single time series can serve very insightfully as the fruit um, it, to provide such plots. Uh, and using such plots to visually get some sense about where are the dynamics of this system headed, uh, how quickly, in what direction uh, are they are they headed? So those are all. That's all, all my comments for today. Um, I will be providing again um, some questions uh, for Friday um, that I'd like you to undertake as a bit of a challenge. They build on today's lecture and and 
a little bit uh, some earlier lectures and we'll discuss the uh, the solutions on Friday. Okay. Thank you very much.